Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. The Jamoti Podcast is powered by Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans, create huge fundraising opportunities, and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. Yeah. Oh. Coach, somehow we went from style of play I know. into all of that good stuff that we just talked about. Okay. Do you want me to go back to style of play? <laughs> yeah, let's go back. Let's go back there because I'm, I'm fascinated uh, to hear what you what you love to teach. Well, I mean, uh, style of play. I mean, zero seconds, as we talked about before. Um, you know, dominoes is the concept. I mean, Alex Sarama has done a great job sharing that. But this concept of once you have advantage, keep the advantage. So once we have the defense in recovery, we are not in a play anymore. We're just constantly in again attacking closeouts, drive and kick or keep the ball moving, that could be ball reversals, different things like that, that obviously keep the advantage. So this dominoes type effect that's obviously so, so important and prevalent in today's game is creating that advantage and then going from there. Uh, floor is lava is another conceptual offensive concept, which is that, uh, you know, if you, if you drive or you cut into space, then you get out of space. Okay. So clear the paint, for example, after a kick out. So we don't want players to hang out. And again, that's that's our concept. I know other coaches that want them to post after a drive or different things like that. But uh, and then another principal play is just again everything's spacing. Like if if you ask my ten uh, year olds a question on offense and they don't know the answer because they don't know most of the answers at that age, they know enough to just say space. <laughs> and that's what I tell them. I say, listen, every offensive question, the answers or the answer is the same: spacing. And now if you, if you came here, Matt, today and you asked any one of them, you know, if you do this and you do this on offense and this and this and this, what's the answer? They'll say spacing because they don't know the answer, but they know spacing matters. So spacing is obviously everything. So see the space, attack the space type of mentality in terms of those things. So just, you know, those are some basic principles of play, but that guides how I teach offense and our player development stuff too. It's how I teach offense uh, to 80 campers from different programs. Mm. You know, it's like, we're going to adhere to these concepts uh, because that's, what's going to help you get better at basketball. And to be honest, you'll be able to go back to whatever system you play in and be better at basketball because we adhere to these principles of offense. That You nailed it. Yeah, that's what I was going to follow up with. It. They're probably going to go back and truly be able to take the skills they're learning with you and plug them in with the exception of small things like when I, when I, if a coach wants them to truly basket cut or, or sit in the post, you know, get their head into the rim or sit in the post, right? But the concepts that you're, you're teaching them they can go home and, and really on their own plug in and and their coach hopefully will notice like an increase in IQ or an increase in their ability to see things and make things happen. Well, I, I hope so. I mean, that's ultimately the goal. I mean, for me, uh, you know, obviously, you know, <laughs> I try and tell kids all the time, look, and look, your coach may tell you to do something completely different than me. But just understand my goal in player development and my goal in a camp setting, for example, is for you to have selfish time. That means I'm only focused on your individual development. It's your coach's job to figure out how you best fit into the team system. I'm not approaching it from that perspective. I'm only approaching it from selfishly, how can you get better? And those are two different things. Now, if I'm coaching my team, there's no separation between player and team development because we're all building the same skills and decision towards the same principles of play. But if I'm coaching your players, Matt, in the summer, then I selfishly want them to get better, but I want them to feel like they should selfishly want to get better. So they go back and now Matt has more possibilities about ways to use them, whether it's on offense or defense. But truly, most of it comes back to offensive development. If you're talking back to fun, I mean, players can say they love defense and some truly do. But mostly we love defense because it helps our team win. Yeah. You know what? Players do not love defense coaches. Don't pretend that they do. They want to improve on offense because it's a lot of fun to shoot. It's a lot of fun to score. And there's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't mean defense isn't important. When they walk into the gym they don't, and there's a ball on the floor, they don't instantly go into slides. They grab the ball 
and they just try to jack it from wherever they're at. Like that, that you're right on yeah. the money. That's a great analogy because Matt, I mean, when you go play pickup with all the the old uh, old people, <laughs> you know, like me, I mean, we're not doing shell drill to start. No. Nope. And we're not doing three man. And week. I can't wait to get personal. I can't wait to get past the defensive end so I can get the ball back oh, and have fun again. Because at this age, I don't, I don't enjoy any part of that <laughs> anymore. So I'll connect defense to play for players as saying, "Hey, this this helps our team win. This is so important to help our team win mm-hmm. and us to experience success." And I mean, all the college coaches and all the stuff on Twitter, you know, all these lists and stuff that say. Oh, you know, be a hard worker, you know, be a great defender, be a great person. Hey, all that's true. I'm not discounting that, but I'm telling you every evaluation starts from offense. Mm. There's not a college coach in the world that doesn't look first at offense and then effort from there. Coach, that it goes right into one of my, I, I don't like the, I personally don't like the be a starter role mm-hmm. argument because the way I understand it, what what's trying to be communicated, which is, on our team, I really need you to rebound and block out. Like, I need you to do that really well because there might be people that, like you said, at the buffet, they're taking more shots and, and we need them to. But I just hear that too often. They use uh, Dennis Rodman or Patrick Beverly as examples. Like, listen, look at guys. Here are guys being stars at their roles. And in my, I kind of cringe because I think, first of all, they're millionaires. They're envy. If you tell me I'll pay you a hundred thousand to sit at the end of the bench, you're never going to play. I would be a star at that right now. I would do that in a heartbeat. But then if they go back and they watch, watch the last dance and watch Rodman in college, that dude scored. He yeah. was like 20 a game. Patrick Beverly was a bucket in college. So to tell a high school kid, just be a star to roll. That's what colleges want. What NBA pl- players do like, no, like, if they're going to get any notice at all, it's going to be for what they can do with the ball in their hands. So my my advice, and you can tell me if I'm kind of wrong in this, and maybe my whole thinking here is, yes, be a star to roll, get, to do whatever you can to get on the floor in high school, but work like heck on your own to develop your shot, your handle, your decision making. Yeah, maybe we should add a but to that. Be a star in your role, but don't be satisfied with your role. Yes, yes. Right? Like to me, that's that's absolutely true. I don't want a player to be satisfied with their role. Like I want them to work beyond their role, you know, and not be satisfied. Now that does not apply for coaches. Like that doesn't apply to the non-basketball players. Like the non-basketball players, the football first that don't play basketball at all, except in your season. I mean, that's different. I mean, they truly just want to be a part of the team and we've got to connect that for them. Mm -hmm. Hey, you're helping us win because you're competing, you're rebounding, you're doing all these things, you know, but, you know, for basketball players, we want them to to value the fact that all that effort they're putting in the off season is leading to them having more possibilities. And uh, there's nothing wrong with saying that for sure. And I couldn't agree with your analogy more in that way. Can't stand it. Can't stand it. Uh, yeah, well, we share a lot of false narratives with players. Mm. Like, I do think, I mean, Twitter's the best thing for basketball in the history of basketball coaching. There's no question. But a lot of these lists that get thousands of likes and stuff like that, I mean, are just like, okay, work hard. Well, really? Like, no, that, no that's something we like, need to yeah. acknowledge. Like, of course you have to work hard. There's, breathe there's air. nothing in life. Breathe yeah. air. Yeah, <laughs> breathe air. Yeah, breathe. Okay, that's cool. All right. Yeah. No, I mean, and and obviously the other part is these generational debates, like players are soft nowadays and things like that. I mean, that's just complete crap. I mean, well, let's just say we're all smarter. Like we're all smarter, and there's, and I hope so. I mean, otherwise Matt and I would still be using Blackberries instead of iPhones, right? Or you know, Google Pixels. I mean, we're all smarter. Things Mm -hmm. things improve, and you know what's improved? Basketball coaching. You know what's really improved? Basketball playing. I mean, the stuff players are doing nowadays, oh, my coach would never have let me do that. Yeah, yeah they wouldn't, my coach wouldn't have let me. Well, because your coach never saw that. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. never saw that that you could do it that well because, you know, again, we were really pigeonholed. And now because players have taken us to this next level. And by the way, players have taken us to this next level, not trainers, not coaches. Players adapt and they have improved so much because they have just put more time and effort into developing their skills in these really unique ways. And, uh, you know, all credit to players that have made us all better. Hey, here, here's an idea. Uh, coach a style of play that you would have wanted to play in high school because uh, the player I was, uh, and I love my high school coach and Tommy Thomas, if you listen to this, this is not 
me bashing you in any way, but you met, you nailed it. It just wasn't even like space and pace wasn't really even a thing. We would play no. fast, but we were all in each other's way. There were single gaps everywhere and, 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 or the same kind of action and flow. But what was most fun was being creative and, and, and having a few options. So maybe that there's an idea there is we need to coach now styles that as players, we would have really appreciated and loved to play. Well, I love that, and especially, again, to high school coaches that are still reluctant for the shot clock. I mean, everyone's, like, fascinated with Europe and how they develop players, but I'll tell you, it's not the coaching. Now, there are great coaches there. There are bad coaches there, just like there are here, but you know what it is? At a really young age, they get more repetitions mm. of offense and defense because there's a shot clock. Yeah, they're so forced take, to play. They're forced, they're forced to, to, play. to play basketball as opposed to the coach taking repetitions away from players by running too much offense. And that that's it. That's the argument. There's nothing else. If Basketball in America is always going to be incredible. Like, you're not getting passed. You have so many players playing. There's so many players that rise above bad coaching, and there's so many great coaches that help players get to levels. But at the end of the day, why do it? Because the, the experience for the player is better. And that's exactly to your point. What style would you want to play? Would you want to play a game? where you paid money as a fan or if you were a player, you worked your butt off all week running suicides and you came to the game and you held the ball. Held it. <laughs> are you kidding me? And now that coach is like, people are celebrating him as a genius. I mean, come on. You're taking athlete satisfaction and enjoyment out of the experience for them. And that to me is worse than just about anything that we could think about. Man. Like if I walk out of practice and I felt like, and I, definitely times I've done that, I've taken enjoyment out of practice for a player through my actions. There's no time that I feel worse about myself, not even a loss. I feel worse about myself in those moments where I did something to take enjoyment away from a player. And uh, every practice, that should be a reflection for coaches. We, we can't allow for players to steal our joy of the game, even when they're acting like teenagers or, or, uh -huh. or, or young men. But the, the opposite of that is true as well. We can't be I, – I, we, we, I don't want to have a practice or, or be a part of a program Maybe maybe this is more like my college experience of how is he today? What kind of mood is he in today? Where players are coming in not knowing what they're about to experience. I think, yeah, we, we can be better. Well, we can be better. And again, like I, how many times, and, and you know this, you know this. I, I experienced this today a little bit where my voice was a little frustrated towards my daughter and just her going into kind of self-pity mode. And normally we would talk through it. And today I kind of, okay, I was a little sharper with it. And I know why, because it was something else bothering me. Yeah. And how often in practice do we take stuff out on players that had nothing to do with the players? And it's like, we've got to get in these Zen, mindful, present states when we go to practice and leave everything else behind. But that's exactly it. What kind, what kind, type of day did you have and what are you bringing into practice? And we're humans. Yeah. So I'm not knocking. We're humans as coaches. And we, but we do, I, yeah. yeah. We gotta, the we more gotta, we acknowledge we're human too, I think the more we can get beyond it. And we try and the narrative for coaches is we've got to be superhuman. Mm -hmm. Like we're above everything else that happens. No, I never human. have bad days. Never. So. No, no, we have good days. We have bad days. And uh, you know what? We make mistakes. And yeah. I think, again, normalizing that for coaches is, is really a part of my journey as well to just say, yeah, look, I made, I'm, I've made a ton of mistakes. I've never been perfect. Mm. <laughs> I never will be. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.